And we start in Brussels, where a flag-raising ceremony to formally mark Sweden's accession to NATO is currently underway. The event is being held at the alliance's headquarters after Sweden officially became its 32nd member in Washington. That's two years after the Nordic country applied to join the military alliance following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In a few moments, we'll take a look at what Sweden brings to NATO. But first, let's hear from the Swedish Prime Minister speaking in Brussels in the last hour. The security situation in our region has not been this serious since the Second World War. And Russia will stay a threat to Euro-Atlantic security for a foreseeable future. It was in this light Sweden applied to join the NATO Defence Alliance to gain security but also to provide security. Oh, given Sweden's location, military power and experience in dealing with Russian aggression, its accession to NATO is widely seen as a blow to the Kremlin. Uh, we've been taking a look at what the country adds to the transatlantic alliance as it looks to bolster its defences against a potential Russian attack. Sweden becomes the second Nordic nation in the past year to join NATO and its membership brings with it a number of advantages for the alliance. Firstly, by following Finland in abandoning neutrality, Sweden is sending an important message to those nations still on the fence about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's time to pick a side. Sweden is now leaving 200 years of neutrality and non-alignment behind. It's a big step. We must take that seriously. But it's also a very natural step that we are taking. Furthermore, the Kremlin can no longer claim Finland's accession was an isolated incident. As NATO seeks to develop defence plans for Eastern members aimed at deterring Russia's advance, Sweden brings considerable experience in understanding how to counter that threat. Sweden's military capability also makes it a powerful new member. The nation boasts cutting-edge aircraft and anti-aircraft missiles, as well as state-of-the-art tanks and submarines, and a considerable fleet of ships. Sweden brings a 500-year-old navy uh, and a navy that is among the largest in the Baltic Sea, where we should remember NATO doesn't have very many large navies. Sweden's geographical position also makes it useful. Firstly, as a land transit route to reinforce fellow members Norway and Finland. And secondly, by allowing NATO to take control of the Baltic Sea in any conflict with Russia via Sweden's enormous coastline. In return, Sweden now has security guarantees from NATO member states should it come under attack from Russia or anyone else in future. The message from Russia's opponents is clear. Both NATO and Sweden are far stronger as a result of this agreement. For eight seconds. And joining us for more on this from NATO headquarters in Brussels is our correspondent, uh, Terry Schulz. Uh, Terry, uh, what's the sense there at NATO headquarters today? Are people uncorking the champagne after what's been a rather rocky process at times over the past two years? Not quite yet, because the flag raising is underway, but I'm certain there will be plenty of bottles uncorked after, as you say, this very long two years, and especially even this last year when Finland was admitted to the alliance, having gotten all the, uh, the approvals from all the other allies a year ago. That left Sweden in a position where it felt very vulnerable, almost like it had a target on it. There was new member Finland on one side and Norway on the other side, but Sweden was not in. And so there's a huge sense of relief here around NATO headquarters. Uh, both Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Christensen and Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg were, were clearly happy, even laughing a little bit, and you don't see that very often here at NATO. So everyone is really in a good mood that this finally, this process finally has come to an end with the ra raising of the Swedish flag here. Hmm. Now, we heard a moment ago from the uh, Swedish Prime Minister, and he said the Russian threat to Euro-Atlantic security tipped the scales for uh, Sweden to join NATO, and that breaks with a long tradition of neutrality. Why does Sweden think joining NATO is a safer bet than staying neutral? 
Well, one of the points he made this morning, and, and we know this also from NATO's change in its military posture, is that they don't believe this threat from Russia is going away anytime soon. Not only will the war in Ukraine not be over quickly, but then Russia will turn to other neighbors, perhaps. And that's, of course, if you're in the Baltic states or you're in the Nordic area, you feel like you could be next. Now, the Swedish defense minister, who we've spoken to many times on our air, used to say, without Article 5, without being a NATO member, we can hope, we can wish, we can even assume that other countries would come to defend us, but we cannot know. We only know once we have Article 5, and that's what NATO membership gives Sweden. Now, what do Sweden and Finland on the other side bring to the table in terms of dealing with a, a potential Russian military threat? Well, these countries are both very much security providers, and uh, Prime Minister Christensen made that point again this morning. Uh, he, they, they aren't necessarily going to be the target of a Russian attack. That would more likely be uh, the Baltic states or Poland, which, uh, you know, are, are they're around uh, normally a target of, of Russia's uh, provocative remarks. Uh, but remember that these countries planned, perhaps for perpetuity, to defend themselves alone. And so they built up their militaries. They have huge stockpiles. They have extremely well-trained uh, troops. They have high levels of recruitment. They uh, Finland kept conscription. So they are bringing very, very strong militaries into the alliance. And frankly, as soon as they decided they wanted to join, many other countries said, great, we're going to learn from Finland and Sweden how to be resilient, how to be self-sufficient, um, how to keep ex extraordinarily good discipline in our ranks. And so everyone is very much looking forward to the day now now when that northern flank is sealed and you've got Finland and Sweden firmly under the NATO umbrella. VW's Brussels correspondent Terry Schultz there reporting from NATO headquarters. Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, one of the most pressing issues facing NATO members is, of course, the war in Ukraine and Kiev's repeated pleas for more arms. For Germany, that debate is now focused on a British proposal to swap cruise missiles. It would see Germany give its Taurus missiles to Britain, who would in turn send Ukraine more of its own Storm Shadow missiles. Germany's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock has said she is open to the idea, but Chancellor Olaf Scholz has so far blocked any decision to send the long-range weapons to Kyiv. He is concerned that they could be used to hit targets in Russia and also that German soldiers would need to be involved in firing them. DW's chief political editor told us more about why we're hearing mixed messages from the German government on the Taurus missiles. Because there are very mixed takes on whether to supply this cruise missile. It's an open secret that Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, who described uh, sending them uh, to Britain, who could then send its missiles uh, to Ukraine, uh, would be an option. She was in favor of sending them straight away. And the German Chancellor is completely set against Germany supplying any such weapons, uh, particularly this tower system, which is seen as uh, pretty much the best of its kind of make in the world, uh, because he's concerned, first of all, over German soldiers potentially being involved in the targeting of this. And uh, secondly, that these missiles have a range that if they were launched from a particular part of Ukraine, they could hit Moscow. So the overarching concern in the Chancellery is that Germany could be seen as a party to this conflict, something German Chancellor Scholz wants to avoid at all cost. The W's chief political editor, Michaela Kufner there.